international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by lynn thompson international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds baron de tronc by clemence robert baron de tronc already had endured a year of arbitrary imprisonment in the fortress of glatz ignorant alike of the cause of his detention or the length of time which he was destined to spend in captivity during the early part of the month of september major du aide to the governor of the prison of glatz entered the prisoner's apartment for a domiciliary visit accompanied by an adjutant and the officer of the guard it was noon the excessive heat of the dying summer had grown almost unsupportable in the tower chamber where baron de tronc was confined half empty flagons were scattered among the books which littered his table but the repeated draughts in which the prisoner had sought refreshment had only served to add to his ever-increasing exasperation the major ransacked every nook and corner of the prisoner's chamber and the interior of such pieces of furniture as might afford a possible hiding place remarking the annoyance which this investigation caused the baron du said arrogantly the general has issued his orders and it is a matter of little consequence to him whether or not they displease you your attempts to escape have greatly incensed him against you and i retorted tronc with like hauteur am equally indifferent to your general's displeasure i shall continue to dispose of my time as may best please me good replied the major but in your own interest you be wiser to philosophize with your books and seek the key to the sciences rather than that of the fortress i do not need your advice major the baron observed with sovereign disdain you may perhaps repent later that you did not heed it your attempts to escape have angered even the king and it is impossible to say just how far his severity toward you may go but great heavens when i am deprived of my liberty without cause have i not the right to endeavour to regain it they do not see the matter in that light in berlin as a matter of fact this spirit of revolt against your sovereign only serves to greatly aggravate your crime my crime tronc exclaimed trembling with anger his glance fell upon the major's sword and the thought came to him to tear it from his side and pierce his throat with it but in the same instant it occurred to him that he might rather profit by the situation pale and trembling as he was he retained sufficient self-control to mollify the expression of his countenance and the tone of his voice though his glance remained fixed upon the sword major he said no one can be called a criminal until he has been so adjudged by the courts happily a man's honour does not depend upon the inconsequent malicious opinion of others on the contrary blame should attach to him who condemns the accused without a hearing no constituted power whether that of king or judge has yet convicted me of any culpable action apart from the courtesy which should be observed between officers of the same rank you out of simple justice should refrain from such an accusation every one knows retorted du that you entered into relations with the enemy i great god do you not consider the pandours then as such i visited their chief solely as a relative a glass of wine shared with him in his tent can hardly be construed into a dangerous alliance but you hoped to inherit great riches from this relative that hope might well impel you to cross the frontier of bohemia for all time why that egregious folly what more could i hope for than that which i already possessed in berlin was i a poor adventurer seeking his fortune by his sword rich in my own right enjoying to the full the king's favour attached to the court by all that satisfied pride 
could demand as well as by ties of the tenderest sentiments what more was there for me to covet or to seek elsewhere the major turned his head aside with an air of indifference one single fact suffices to discount everything you have said baron he said dryly you have twice attempted to escape from the fortress an innocent man awaits his trial with confidence knowing that it cannot be other than favorable the culprit alone flees Tronk, though quivering with blind rage continued to maintain his former attitude his features composed his eyes fixed upon the major's sword sir he said in three weeks on the twenty fifth of september i shall have been a prisoner for one year you in your position may not have found the time long but to me it has dragged interminably and it has been still harder for me to bear because i have not been able to count the days or hours which still separate me from justice and liberty if i knew the limit set to my captivity no matter what it may be i could surely find resignation and patience to await it it is most unfortunate then said the major that no one could give you that information say rather would not replied tromp surely something of the matter must be known here you for instance major might tell me frankly what you think to be the case ah said do assuming the self-satisfied manner of a jailer it would not be proper for me to answer that you would save me from despair and revolt replied tronk warmly for i give you my word of honor that from the moment i know when my captivity is to terminate no matter when that may be or what my subsequent fate i will make no further attempts to evade it by flight and you want me to tell you yes interrupted tronk with a shudder yes once again i ask you do smiled maliciously as he answered the end of your captivity why a traitor can scarcely hope for release the heat of the day the wine he had drunk overwhelming anger and his fiery blood all mounted to tronk's head incapable of further self-restraint he flung himself upon the major tore the coveted sword from his side dashed out of the chamber flung the two sentinels at the door down the stairs took their entire length himself at a single bound and sprang into the midst of the assembled guards tronk fell upon them with his sword showering blows right and left the blade flashed snake-like in his powerful grasp the soldiers falling back before the fierce onslaught having disabled four of the men the prisoner succeeded in forcing his way past the remainder and raced for the first rampart there he mounted the rampart and never stopping to gauge its height sprang down into the moat landing upon his feet in the bottom of the dry ditch faster still he flew to the second rampart and scaled it as he had done the first clambering up by means of projecting stones and interstices it was just past noon the sun blazed full upon the scene and every one within the prison stood astounded at the miraculous flight in which tronk seemed to fairly soar through the air those of the soldiers whom tronk had not overthrown pursued but with little hope of overtaking him their guns were unloaded so that they were unable to shoot after him not a soldier dared to risk trying to follow him by the road he had taken over the ramparts and moats for without that passion for liberty which lent wings to the prisoner there was no hope of any of them scaling the walls without killing himself a dozen times over they were therefore compelled to make use of the regular passages to the outer posterns and these latter being located at a considerable distance from the prisoner's avenue of escape he was certain at the pace he was maintaining to gain at least a half hour's start over his pursuers once beyond the walls of the prison with the woods close by it seemed as if tronk's escape was assured beyond doubt he had now come to a narrow passageway leading to the last of the inner posterns which pierced the walls here he found a sentinel on guard and the soldier sprang up to confront him but a soldier to overcome was not an obstacle to stop the desperate flight of the baron 
he struck the man heavily in the face with his sword stunning him and sending him rolling in the dust once through the postern there now remained only a single palisade or stockade a great fence constructed of iron bars and iron trellis work which constituted the outermost barrier between the fleeing prisoner and liberty once over that iron palisade he had only to dash into the woods and disappear but it was ordained that tronk was not to overcome this last obstacle simple as it appeared at a fatal moment his foot was caught between two bars of the palisade and he was unable to free himself while he was engaged in superhuman but futile efforts to release his foot the sentinel of the passage who had picked himself up ran through the postern toward the palisade followed by another soldier from the garrison together they fell upon tronk overwhelming him with blows with the butts of their muskets and secured him bruised and bleeding he was borne back to his cell major Dew informed tronk after this abortive attempt to escape that he had been condemned to one year's imprisonment only that year was within three weeks of expiring when the infamous major who was an italian goaded the unfortunate young man into open defiance of his sovereign's mandate his pardon was at once annulled and his confinement now became most rigorous another plot headed by three officers and several soldiers of the guard who were friendly to tronk was discovered at the last moment in time for the conspirators themselves to escape to bohemia but under circumstances which prevented baron de tronk from accompanying them it also served to increase the hardships of the prisoner's lot and he now found himself deprived of the former companionship of his friends and surrounded by strangers the one familiar face remaining being that of lieutenant bach a danish officer a braggart swordsman and ruffler who had always been hostile to him but despite his isolation the energy and strength of tronk's character were only augmented by his misfortunes and he never ceased to plot for his deliverance Weeks passed without any fruitful event occurring in the life of the prisoner yet help was to come to him from a source from which he could never have expected it But before that fortuitous result was destined to take place in fact as preliminary to its achievement He was destined to be an actor in the most remarkable scene that ever has been recorded in the annals of prison life and in one of the strangest duels of modern times one day tronk had cast himself fully clothed upon his bed in order to obtain a change of position in his cramped place of confinement lieutenant bark was on duty as his guard the young baron had retained in prison the proud and haughty demeanor which had formerly brought upon him so much censure at court lieutenant bark's countenance also bore the imprint of incarnate pride the two exchanged from time to time glances of insolence for the rest they remained silently smoking side by side Tronk was the first to break the silence for prisoners grasp every opportunity for conversation and at any price It appears to me your hand is wounded lieutenant Tronk said have you found another opportunity to cross swords? Lieutenant shall it seemed to me look somewhat obliquely at me replied the Dane Therefore I indulged him in a pass or two directed against his right arm Such a delicate youth and so mild-mannered are you not ashamed? What could I do there was no one else at hand? Nevertheless he seems to have wounded you Yes accidentally though without knowing what he did The fact then of having been expelled from two regiments for your high-handed acts and finally transferred to the garrison of the fortress of glatz as punishment has not cured you of your fire-eating propensities when a man has the reputation of being the best swordsman in prussia he values that title somewhat more than your military rank which any clumsy fool can obtain you the best swordsman exclaimed tronk concluding his remark with an ironical puff of smoke I flatter myself that such is the case retorted bark emitting in turn a great cloud of tobacco smoke If I were free said tronk I might perhaps prove to you in short order that such is not the case Do you claim to be my master at that art? 
i flatter myself that such is the case that we shall soon see cried bart flushing with rage how can we i am disarmed and a prisoner ah uh, yes you make your claim out of sheer boastfulness because you think we cannot put it to the test truly lieutenant set me at liberty and i swear to you that on the other side of the frontier we will put our skill to the test as freely as you like well i am unwilling to wait for that we will fight here baron tronk in this room after your assertion i must either humble your arrogance or lose my reputation i should be glad to know how you propose to do so ah you talk of bohemia because that country is far away as for me i prefer this one because it affords an immediate opportunity to put the matter to the test i should ask nothing better if it were not impossible impossible you shall see if it be bach sprang up an old door supported by a couple of benches had been placed in the chamber for a table he hammered at the worm-eaten wood and knocked off a strip which he split in half one of these substitutes for rapiers he gave to tronk retaining the other himself and both placed themselves on guard after the first few passes tronk sent his adversary's makeshift sword flying through space and with his own he met the lieutenant full in the chest touche he cried heavens it is true growled bach but i'll have my revenge he went out hastily tronk watched him in utter amazement and he was even more astounded when an instant later he saw bach return with a couple of swords which he drew out from beneath his uniform now he said to tronk it is for you to show what you can do with good steel you risk returned the baron smiling calmly you risk over and above the danger of being wounded losing that absolute superiority in matters of the sword of which you are so proud defend yourself braggart shouted bach show your skill instead of talking about it he flung himself furiously upon tronk the latter seemingly only to trifle lightly with his weapon at first parried his thrusts and then pressed the attack in turn wounding bach severely in the arm the lieutenant's weapon clattered upon the floor for an instant he paused immovable overcome by amazement then an irresistible admiration a supreme tenderness invaded his soul he flung himself weeping in tronk's arms exclaiming you are my master then drawing away from the prisoner he contemplated him with the same enthusiasm but more reflectively and observed yes baron you far exceed me in the use of the sword you are the greatest duelist of the day and a man of your caliber must not remain longer in prison the baron was somewhat taken by surprise at this but with his usual presence of mind he immediately set himself to derive such profit as he might from his guardian's extravagant access of affection yes my dear bark he replied yes i should be free for the reason you mention and by every right but where is the man who will assist me to escape from these walls here baron said the lieutenant you shall regain your freedom as surely as my name is bach oh i believe in you my worthy friend cried tronk you will keep your word wait resumed bach reflectively you cannot leave the citadel without the assistance of an officer i should compromise you at every step you have just seen what a hot-tempered scatterbrain i am but i have in mind one who admires you profoundly you shall know who he is tonight and together we will set you at liberty bath did in fact redeem his promise he introduced lieutenant shell who was to be tronk's companion during their arduous flight into bohemia into the prisoner's cell and himself obtained leave of absence for the purpose of securing funds for his fellow conspirators the plot was discovered before his return and shell warned of this by one of the governor's adjutants hastened the day of their flight in scaling the first rampart shell fell and sprained his ankle so severely that he could not use it but tronk was equal to all emergencies he would not abandon his companion he placed him across his shoulders and thus burdened climbed the outer barriers and wandered all night in the bitter cold 
fleeing through the snow to escape his pursuers in the morning by a clever ruse he secured two horses and thus mounted he and his companions succeeded in reaching bohemia Tronk directed his course towards Brandenburg where his sister dwelt near the Prussian and Bohemian frontiers in the castle of Valdau For he counted upon her assistance to enable him to settle in a foreign land where he would be safe The two friends reduced shortly to the direst poverty Parted with their horses and all but the most necessary wearing apparel Even now though in Bohemia they were not free from pursuit impelled one night through hunger and cold to throw themselves upon the bounty of an innkeeper they found in him a loyal and true friend the worthy host revealed to them the true identity of four supposed traveling merchants who had that day accosted them on the road and followed them to the inn these men were in fact emissaries from the fortress of glatz who had attempted to bribe him to betray the fugitives into their hands for they were sworn to capture Tronk and his companion and return them dead or alive to the enraged governor of the fortress in the morning the four prussians the carriage the driver and the horses set forth and soon disappeared in the distance two hours later the fugitives fortified by a good breakfast took their departure from the Essenstockau inn leaving behind them a man whom they at least esteemed as the greatest honor to mankind the travelers hastened toward dankov they chose the most direct route and tramped along in the open without a thought of the infamous spies who might already be on their track they arrived at nightfall at their destination however without further hindrance the next day they set out for Parsimachi in bohemia they started early and a day in the open together with a night's sleep had almost obliterated the memory of their adventures at the inn the cold was intense the day was gray with heavy clouds that no longer promised rain but which shrouded the country with a pall of gloom the wind swirled and howled and though the two friends struggled to keep their few thin garments drawn closely about them they still searched the horizon hopefully thinking of the journey's end and the peaceful existence which awaited them to their right the aspect of the countryside had altered somewhat great wooded stretches spread away into the distance while to the left all was yet free and open they had gone about half a mile past the first clump of trees when they noticed through the swaying branches by the roadside a motionless object around which several men busied themselves with every step they gained a clearer impression of the nature of this obstacle until at last an expression of half mockery half anger overspread their features now god forgive me exclaimed shell finally but that is the infernal brown travelling carriage from the inn may the devil take me rejoined tronk if i delay or flee a step from those miserable rascals and they strode sturdily onward as soon as they were within speaking distance one of the prussians a big man in a furred cap believing them to be wholly unsuspicious called to them my dear sirs in heaven's name come help us our carriage has been overturned and it is impossible to get it out of this rut the friends had reached an angle of the road where a few withered tree branches alone separated them from the others they perceived the brown body of the carriage half open like a huge rat trap and beside it the forbidden faces of their would-be captors Tronk launched these words through the intervening screen of branches go to the devil miserable scoundrels that you are and may you remain there then swift as an arrow he sped toward the open fields to the left of the high road feigning flight the carriage which had been overturned solely for the purpose of misleading them was soon righted and the driver lashed his horses forward in pursuit of the fugitives the four prussians accompanying him with drawn pistols when they were almost within reaching distance of their prey they raised their pistols and shouted surrender rascals or you are dead men this was what tronk desired he wheeled about and discharged his pistol sending a bullet through the first prussian's breast stretching him dead upon the spot 
At the same moment Shell fired, but his assailants returned the shot and wounded him. Tronk again discharged his pistol twice in succession. Then, as one of the Prussians, who was apparently still uninjured, took to flight across the plain, he sped furiously after him. The pursuit continued some two or three hundred paces. The Prussian, as if impelled by some irresistible force, whirled around, and Tronk caught sight of his blanched countenance and blood-stained linen. One of the shots had struck him. Instantly, Tronk put an end to the half-finished task with a sword thrust but the time wasted on the Prussian had cost him dear. Returning hastily to the field of action, he perceived Shell struggling in the grasp of the two remaining Prussians. Wounded as he was, he had been unable to cope single-handed with them, and was rapidly being borne toward the carriage. Courage, Shell! Tronk shouted. I am coming! At the sound of his friend's voice, Shell felt himself saved. By a supreme effort, he succeeded in releasing himself from his captors. Frantic with rage and disappointment, the Prussians again advanced to the attack upon the two wretched fugitives. But Tronk's blood was up. He made a furious onslaught upon them with his sword, driving them back step by step to their carriage, into which they finally tumbled, shouting to the driver in frantic haste to whip up his horses. As the carriage dashed away, the friends drew long breaths of relief and wiped away the blood and powder stains from their heated brows. Careless of their sufferings, these iron-hearted men merely congratulated each other upon their victory. Ah, it's well indeed, Shell, exclaimed Tronk, and I rejoice that we have had this opportunity to chastise the miserable traitors. But you are wounded, my poor Shell. It is nothing, the lieutenant replied carelessly, merely a wound in the throat, and, I think, another in the head. This was the last attempt for a considerable time to regain possession of Tronk's person. But the two friends suffered greatly from hardships, and were made to feel more than once the cruelty of Prussian oppression. Even Tronk's sister, instigated thereto by her husband, who feared to incur the displeasure of Frederick the Great, refused the poor fugitive shelter money or as much as a crust of bread and this after tronk had jeopardized his liberty by returning to prussian soil in order to meet her it was at this period when starvation stared the exiles in the face that tronk met the russian general levin a relative of tronk's mother who offered the baron a captaincy in the tobolsk dragoons and furnished him with the money necessary for his equipment tronk and shell were now compelled to part the latter journeying to italy to rejoin relatives there the baron to go to russia where he was to attain the highest eminence of grandeur baron de tronk on his journey to russia passed through danzig which was at that time neutral territory bordering upon the confines of prussia here he delayed for a time in the hope of meeting with his cousin the pandour during the interim he formed an intimacy with a young prussian officer named henry whom he assisted lavishly with money almost daily they indulged in excursions in the environs the prussian acting as guide one morning while at his toilet tronk's servant karl who was devoted to him body and soul observed Lieutenant Henry will enjoy himself thoroughly on your excursion tomorrow. Why do you say that, Karl? asked the Baron. Because he has planned to take your honour to Langfour at ten o'clock. At ten or eleven, the hour is not of importance. No, you must be there on the stroke of ten by the village clock. Langfour is on the Prussian border and under Prussian rule. Prussia? exclaimed Tronk, shaking his head, which Karl had not finished powdering are you quite sure perfectly eight prussians non-commissioned officers and soldiers will be in the courtyard of the charming little inn that lieutenant henry described so well as soon as your honour crosses the threshold they will fall upon you and bear you off to a carriage which will be in waiting finish dressing my hair karl said tronk recovering his wonted impassibility oh for that matter continued the valet they will have neither muskets nor pistols. They will be armed with swords only. That will leave them free to fall bodily upon your honour, and to prevent you using your weapon. Is that all, Karl? No. 
there will be two soldiers detailed especially for my benefit so that i can't get away to give the alarm well is that all no the carriage is to convey your honour to Levenberg in pomerania and you must cross a portion of the province of danzig to get there besides the under officers at the inn who will travel with your honour two others will accompany the carriage on horseback to prevent any outcry while you are on neutral ground famously planned monsieur reimer the prussian resident here outlined the plot and appointed lieutenant henry to carry it out afterward car that's all this time and it's enough yes but i regret that it should end thus for your account has greatly interested me your honour may take it that all i have said is absolutely correct but when did you obtain this information oh just now and from whom franz lieutenant henry's valet when we were watching the horses beneath the big pines while your honours waited in that roadside pavilion for the shower to pass over is his information reliable of course as no one suspected him the whole matter was discussed freely before him and he betrayed the secret yes because he greatly admires your honour and wasn't willing to see you treated so carl give him ten ducats from my purse and tell him i will take him in my own service for he has afforded me great pleasure the outing to-morrow will be a hundred times more amusing than i had hoped indeed more amusing than any i have ever undertaken in my life your honour will go to langfour then certainly carl we will go together and you shall see if i misled you when i promised you a delightful morning as soon as baron de tronc had completed his toilet he visited monsieur scherer the russian resident spent a few moments in private with him and then returned to his apartments for dinner lieutenant henry arrived soon afterward tronc found delight in the course of dissimulation to which he stood committed he overwhelmed his guest with courteous attentions pressing upon him the finest wines and his favorite fruits meanwhile beaming upon him with an affection that overspread his whole countenance and expatiating freely upon the delights of the morrow's ride henry accepted his attentions with his accustomed dreamy manner the next morning at half past nine when the lieutenant arrived he found tronc awaiting him the two officers rode off followed by their servants and took the road to langfour tronc's audacity was terrifying even karl who was well aware of his master's great ability and cleverness was nevertheless uneasy and franz who was less familiar with the baron's character was in a state of the greatest alarm the country beautiful with its verdant grasslands its budding bushes and flowers its rich fields of wheat dotted with spring blossoms revealed itself to their delighted eyes in the distance glistened the tavern of langfour with its broad red and blue stripes and its tempting signboards that displayed a well-appointed festive table the low door in the wall that enclosed the tavern courtyard was still closed inside to the right of that door was a little terrace and against the wall was an arbor formed of running vines and ivy lieutenant henry pausing near a clump of trees some two hundred paces from the tavern said baron our horses will be in the way in that little courtyard i think it would be well to leave them here in the care of our servants until our return tronc assented readily he sprang from his horse and tossed his bridle to his valet and henry did the same the path leading to the tavern was enchanting with its carpet of flowers and moss and the two young men advanced arm in arm in the most affectionate manner karl and franz watched them overwhelmed with anxiety the door in the wall had been partly opened as they approached and the young men saw within the arbor on the terrace the resident herr reimer his three-cornered hat on his powdered wig his arms crossed on the top of the adjacent wall as he awaited their coming as soon as the officers were within earshot he called out come on baron de tronc breakfast is ready the two officers were almost at the threshold tronc slackened his pace somewhat then he felt henry grip his arm more closely 
and forcibly dragged him towards the doorway Tronk energetically freed his arm upon observing this movement that spoke so eloquently of betrayal and twice struck the lieutenant with such violence that henry was thrown to the ground Reimer, the resident, realizing that Tronk knew of the plot, saw that the time had come to resort to armed intervention. Soldiers, in the name of Prussia, I command you to arrest Baron de Tronk, he shouted to the men who were posted in the courtyard. Soldiers, in the name of Russia, Tronk shouted, brandishing his sword, kill these brigands who are violating the rights of the country. At these words, six Russian dragoons emerged suddenly from a field of wheat, and, running up, fell upon the Prussians who had rushed from the courtyard at the resident's command. This unexpected attack took the Prussians by surprise. They defended themselves only half-heartedly, and finally they fled in disorder, throwing away their weapons, and followed by the shots of the Russians. Lieutenant Henry and four soldiers remained in the custody of the victors. Tronk dashed into the arbor to seize resident Reimer, but the only evidence of that personage was his wig, which remained caught in the foliage at an opening in the rear of the arbor through which the resident had made his escape. Tronk then returned to the prisoners. As a fitting punishment for the Prussian soldiers, he commanded his dragoons to give each of them fifty blows, to turn their uniforms wrong side out, to decorate their helmets with straw cockades, and to drive them thus attired across the frontier. While his men proceeded to execute his orders, Tronk drew his sword and turned to Lieutenant Henry. "'And now for our affair, Lieutenant,' he exclaimed. The unfortunate Henry, under the disgrace of his position, lost his presence of mind. Hardly knowing what he did, he drew his sword, but dropped it almost immediately, begging for mercy. Tronk endeavoured to force him to fight, without avail, then, disgusted with the Lieutenant's cowardice, he caught up a stick and belaboured him heartily, crying, Rogue, go tell your fellows how Tronk deals with traitors. The people of the inn, attracted by the noise of the conflict, had gathered around the spot, and, as the baron administered the punishment, they added to the shame of the disgraced lieutenant by applauding the baron heartily. The punishment over the sentence of the Prussians having been carried out, Tronk returned to the city with his six dragoons and two servants. In this affair, as throughout his entire career, Tronk was simply faithful to the rule which he had adopted to guide him through life. Always face danger rather than avoid it. End of Baron de Tronk by Clemence Robert